For this t today, we're talking about apologetics again. <coughs> and the, the subject, <coughs> excuse me, the subject today is anything that has a beginning has a cause. And we're, that's going to be an, a subject that we'll be talking about with regard to talking to people that you may know that uh, may question the existence of God. Uh, also, very excellent for Christians that are dealing with their prayer life. And um, does God continue to hear my prayer? You know, where, well, it doesn't seem like I'm getting any answers from God. But last week, what did we talk about last week? I want to talk about this as we go. We'll do a little review or try to the first of every week. So apologetics, what, what did we talk about last week? What was the argument? Yes. Okay, right and wrong, which was the moral argument. Okay, we made, made the argument that Without a single being, call him God or call him whatever you will, uh, because some atheist will not give you to call, call that entity God, but without a single being dictating the morality, morality could not be a common factor, objective common factor in every human being, everywhere and at every time frame. There, there is an objective moral value that is within every human being and we talked about the fact that the, that goes back to the scripture which we can't do in the argument but we go back to the scripture that we know that uh, God has written the moral law upon the hearts of men uh, Cindy asked last time about uh, Jeremiah 31 I couldn't remember the verse it was verse 33 is where that comes from Jeremiah 31 33 You'll also find in the New Testament the, argue, the, the argument that God has written the moral law upon the hearts of men in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15 and in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16. And we'll actually be talking about that a little bit more this morning during the worship hour. So that was the moral argument. We also talked about a couple of other things that, um, I'm going to skip through this if I can. Okay, talk, talk about the ontology or ontological argument. Ontology is just the study of being or beginnings. That, uh, and so today I go back to this because the argument is everything that has a beginning has a cause. So this is a type of ontology uh, talking about being and beginnings. The message in the sky we talked about last week, uh, or we talked about Mount Rushmore. I don't think we talked about message in the sky, but here's, Here's that, that little example. You walk out the door today after church and you look up in the sky and you see the words written out, Happy Birthday, John. It looks like a cloud, but it says Happy Birthday, John. Do you think that just kind of naturally happened in the clouds? Or what do you deduct from that? Somebody flew and wrote, wrote those words in the sky. It had a cause. It had a causal agent, it's not a natural formation. It had a cause. So th this goes back to what we're talking about today. Teleology is just design or the argument from design. Uh, it, it goes to purpose. If you look at design, design seems to always result in a purpose. And this is an argument for David O, intelligent design. Intelligent design, there's an intelligent designer. If there, is, if there is a design in the universe, there is an intelligent designer. So that's, the, in other words, a cause. Uh, we talked about the eye. So, uh, yes? the eye would have had to occur by chance in all different sorts of ways. Like there are different eyes for lobsters, uh, different eyes for insects, and mm -hmm. different eyes for mammals. Yeah. So the eye would have had to occur by chance um, uh, three different ways, at least three different ways. Yeah. Excellent point. Okay, so we're, today we're going to look at, again, we're going to look at a logical argument. We talked about syllogisms. What was a syllogism? Remember last week? It's not a syllogism, it's a syllogism. Okay. Only God can forgive sins. 
Jesus forgave sins, therefore Jesus is God. Okay. Two premises that are true and objectively true, and they, if, the, if the conclusion follows, naturally follows, it is objectively true. So the two premises have to be objectively true for the, for the following. So you got two premises. So he said only God can forgive sin. That's a premise. Jesus forgave sin. That's another premise. And the conclusion would be Jesus is God. So the conclusion follows the two premises. The two premises have to be objectively true. Now, of course, the, the atheist would not accept the premises as being true. So we have to have something that relates to what the natural world presents. Uh, and we're going to talk about that today, as a matter of fact. So, so two premises that have to do with the beginning of the universe. That, that ontology, teleology examples are pertinent here. So the defense for the existence of God today is going to be looking at what is called the cosmological argument. Don't get hung up in the word. Okay, let me tell you how easy it is. It's called cause and effect. That's all it means, is cause and effect. There is a cause. It, for every effect there, that, that began to exist, there was a cause. Okay, so everything that has a beginning has a cause is going to be the first one of the uh, premises. Okay, then, then the second premise is going to be the universe had a cause, or had a beginning. And the conclusion is, therefore, the universe had a cause. So the argument from the, from the atheist standpoint has got to be to disprove the universe had a beginning, okay, to, in order to say that it didn't have a cause, or to say that it, things that had a beginning don't have a cause. In other words, they just kind of pop into existence and they can pop out of existence. And the whole argument now from this whole thing, you've probably heard of somebody talk about quantum theory or quantum mechanics. And, and it, all that is is the, the quantum theorist, physicist and, and theorist, what they've done is they've, they've taken a vacuum, taken that vacuum to absolute zero, and absolute zero is the place no molecular motion can continue to exist. If there's no motion, they, they assume there's nothing there. But all it means is there's no motion of what's there. And then things come into existence when they change the temperature, they say. And then when they reduce the temperature, it seems to go back out of existence. Well, all it is is the, the, the molecules start moving again af above absolute zero. So, but they're, they're saying there's nothing there, now there's something there, now there's nothing there. So be, be leery of these guys that want to tell you, oh, it happens all the time. They just pop, things pop into existence. It's like a rabbit pops into existence on the floor and you go, Oh, I never seen that before. Yeah. Well, they 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 consider themselves more intelligent than us because they can actually think that highly. They're they're <laughs> they're more highly evolved than you and I. So that's that's the argument. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a video today um, that Elva's gonna immediately recognize the voice. I haven't told her about this, but she'll immediately recognize the voice because it was a member of our church in North Carolina. Um, and as a matter of fact, I just talked to this lady's husband this past week. So the cosmological argument is just the argument for uh, cause and effect. Okay, let's... let's do it. Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, 
it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Okay, so everybody going to remember the cosmological argument. It'll, it will be. It'll be on part of this YouTube thing. Anything that has a beginning has a cause. So why do we not say just any, any, any effect has a cause? Why do we not say that anything has, everything has a cause? Instead of anything that has a beginning has a cause. Now, I'll, I'll, this is worth thinking about. It really is worth thinking about. What are you trying to prove? Okay. Yes, David. That would include God. God has no beginning because he has always existed. He is he's eternal. That's one of the attributes of God. God is eternal. So the, the argument is anything that has a beginning has a cause. But God is eternal, and God has no cause. He has eternally existed. Okay. Even before time and space, God existed. It, and that's why the, the, what she just said is true. The beginning of the universe had to be from something that was immaterial outside of space and time. Because it, the God had to be outside of space and time because there was no space and time. There was literally against what the atheists are now arguing now, no thing, no thing, not just frozen things, but no thing. Yes. It almost makes you realize that everything then is supernatural. 
Everything had to have a supernatural beginning, yeah. Now, the deists would argue that God spun it into existence, and it just continues on, but we're not there to argue that today. But we're talking about um, this argument that says God exists. We're talking to people who would either deny God's existence or question God's existence, and we're not, as we said last week, proving indelibly that God exists. What we're doing is giving evidence for the fact that he can't and must exist. So you, it's not like you're, you're showing a scientific experiment and said, okay, mix this and this, and here's God. Okay, we're giving overwhelming empirical evidence that God exists. Yes. <coughs> they said on the on the video that uh, there was a finite point. Finite and, point in time. <coughs> and that the universe is expanding out from that point. Um, I've heard that the Milky Way is the center of that. Could be, but there, there, there's another argument that we're, we'll not be able to talk about today, too, <laughs> called the androgynous principle that says that right after God created, he tweaked things, and it was sort of his fingerprint on things. So th some scientists that would argue that, others would argue against it, but again, we're not here to, to talk about that today. But it did uh, come from a single point. Now, here, here is what the minds of those will do. I, I just want to show you the... the, the uh, overwhelming trials that people will do in mental gymnastics that people will do that are, and, and, you, and you mentioned it here, Ruthie, that people are, are really striving to try to do everything they can to prove that God does not exist. <clears throat> when Einstein was working with this and showing that things uh, had to be expanding in the universe and that the, the principle was that, that there was a, a beginning to the universe all came out of his theory, a second a law of thermodynamics. Then Hubble proved later on that their single point existed and that was theorized before that. But Einstein then tried to prove that what, what was that single point? Where did that point come from? And Einstein, Einstein now, put in his mathematical formula dividing by zero in order to eliminate that point, which he later said was a childish mistake. Even children are taught that you can't divide by zero. But he put it, actually put it in a formula for trying to get rid of that point in time. So that's the mental gymnastics that some atheists will go through to try to disprove the existence of God. Now, Let's, let's just go through some of this. Here's, here's the argument again. Whatever begin, begins to exist has a cause. The universe had a beginning, which, which <coughs> at some point in time, when the atheists were arguing that the universe had always existed and there was no real evidence to the contrary, there were people who were running from, the, in the Christian community, who were running from science. And I'm arguing now we need to run towards science. We need to run into the, the battlefield of archaeology. We need to dig up everything we can because the more we begin to discover and bring out of the earth that, that God left us to, to examine, the more we're showing the existence of, a, of the God of the Bible. Yeah, David. Get the microphone in here. that the more advances that they're making in archaeology, in uh, genetics in particular, the stronger the evidence is becoming for the existence of the creation yeah. by God. Yeah. And like you said, we, we as Christians and apologists should run towards science yeah. because science is making our case over time. Yeah, and in, in the time of the Industrial Revolution, there was a massive division between the church, uh, pastors, and the scientific community because the scientific community seemed to be advancing in, in their effort to disprove God quicker than the minds of the scholars were keeping up and from the Christian community to, to 
talk to people reasonably about those things. And part of the problem became that the pastors ran and said, don't look at science. And when we did that, we, we made ourselves fools because if we genuinely believe that God created the universe, the universe will reveal his glory. Amen. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The universe declares the glory of God. And so we ought to be running toward those evidences and, and digging deeper instead of trying to cover up what's been unearthed. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, and this is from a person that has no belief in, in, in God at all. Yeah, that we're, all we're doing is discovering what God was doing some time ago. Uh, so just, just be aware that we, we should be advancing our thoughts in these areas to talk to people reasonably, reason thought, which is what we're taught and told to be ready to do, give a reason for the, for the hope that's within us, to give reason thought about these things to people who don't know him. Why is this important? I mean, are we just doing this to do mental gymnastics here? More than a one-liner, I can't remember it. Sorry. <laughs> Some of these scientific questions that you pose and the answer to them have a logical response. And the person would say, you know, that those people who think that that's the case is the dead. We just don't do it. Yes. And we, 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 we can make this simple argument. This is not a complex argument. Complex arguments might have 10 or 12 premises before the conclusion. This is a very simple argument that every Christian should be able to have in their arsenal to talk to people who may not believe or question God's existence. And then, and then you can start to have the, uh, some reason thought with people. And this is the, the, the idea here is to argue toward the Bible rather than from the Bible. You argue from the Bible with believers or people that are close to that point, but you don't argue from the Bible with an atheist who gives it no credibility. He immediately shuts you down and says, I give no credibility to that whatsoever. So let's talk to him about what he believes in. He believes in science. Let's talk about it. All these people that he talked about, you don't have to remember all those. All you need to do is, re is remember this little thing, this little ditty. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. All, science, all reasonable scientists and all well thought of scientists today now believe this. All the other things that, that were given as reasons uh, earlier, I'm going to go back through if we've got time, just to show you a few, again, of the mental gymnastics that non-believers will go through that are brilliant minds, absolutely brilliant minds, that, um, that will try to come up with things that, that, to give some reason for why we don't have to believe this. Okay. David, do you have something? Well, I was just going to say that um, often uh, I'm thinking of an unbeliever I was talking to that says that Christians believe in fairy tales. And then the same person came to me and said, hey, did you hear they discovered a planet that's 96 light years away and it has the same atmosphere as Earth? Yeah. I'm going, well, how do you know it has the same atmosphere? Oh, because they've taken pictures of it and they've done this and that. And I'm going, no, they're theorizing. Yeah. And um, I'm not the only one who believes in fairy tales, yeah, if you believe that's that. Right, that's right. Okay, cause and effect. We've been taught this since we were little kids, that there's everything that has a cause has an effect. The question, only question is what came first, chicken or egg, but one caused the other, other the other was a cause or effect of, of the other. Did the universe begin? Well, 
but some say that it's always existed. And then they give reasons why they believe that this is the case. Uh, Bertrand Russell uh, said the universe is just there, that's all. Why, do, why, would, why would he make that argument? Because he, he doesn't want to have to explain a beginning. And, and here's what the, a lot of these scientists do, including Bertrand Russell, who has who is, uh, written volumes and volumes and volumes on su subjects like this. Bertrand Russell uh, just makes the declaration as if everybody understands that's basic principle, of, 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 and you're foolish if you don't believe that. He just makes it like that and moves on. But he gives no reason, and yet he's, he's said to be a reasoned scientist. You know, we, we, we've got to be able to talk to people and show them their own downfall. You, you've just made that statement. You, you must have faith in that. Why, can you give me some evidence for that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but with the advance of the Hubble telescope, uh, all of you have heard of the, probably the Hubble telescope, uh, still functioning. Uh, the showed there is a finite past, and it has a point in time from which everything sprang. Okay, steady state theory, uh, what they are, so part of the problem is the universe is running out of energy, and that's what Einstein came up with. The steady state theory said, well, the universe is getting bigger, but it has the same amount of energy, and it's just kind of producing energy. But, but that was disproved. The energy volume is going down over time. Oscillating model theory, that, there's, uh, that the universe kind of popped into existence. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go through this rotation, and it's going to come back down to a place that it will go out of existence and kind of bounce off of that and come back into existence and go back up again. Uh, then there's one that's called a vacuum fluctuation. I'm not sure I even know enough about that to talk about it. But here, you recognize this guy right here? Stephen Hawking. Uh, he came up with a quantum gravity theory. It's very complex as well, but basically he is saying that things pop into existence and pop out of existence all the time. It just happens. But, but that's right. It's not true, but he, he uses that model I talked about earlier where he takes a vacuum and reduces it to absolute zero, and there's no motion in it. So he, has, he presumes there's nothing there. You warm it up a little bit, and the motion starts again. And it, it's just the fact that molecular motion can't happen at absolute zero or below. So, but he's saying, see, things exist. Things don't exist. See, things exist. But now that's been disproven. So that's, that's down the drain as well. So, any universe which has on average been expanding throughout history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. That's coming from Alexander Blinken, who is no believer. He's saying, I don't understand it, but it had to have a beginning. And it had to be a causal agent to the beginning. But he doesn't, he can't, he doesn't explain it. He doesn't attempt to explain it. And that's where a lot of these guys get. They'll get to the place like this, and they say, well, we have to admit this, but I'm not willing to give you a reason why this is true or even a possibility why this is true. See, a lot of times as Christians, we think we've got to give an absolute answer as to why something's true. And, and many times, all we have to do is give a possibility. This might be what God did then. This could be what God did then. I don't know. But there's at least two possibilities right there. You can see what I'm saying? And, but they offer no possibility. It had a beginning. There's no possibility of answering that. Multiverse. One guy came up with this idea of multiverses. Now tell me what's wrong with this. Think, put on your thinking caps here. There's a universe, and it spins a planet out and creates another universe. And then and over time, that spins another planet out and creates another universe. And over time, that spins another planet out, and it's called a multiverse. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that argument? Because they're showing something that might be true. Well, that's what I'm getting the question. Why don't you just Wait, get this, get this on, get this on. Yeah. It begs the question of where did the first planet come from? Exactly. You've got to go back and say, well, where did the first one come from? You haven't had an eternal group of universes that have already always existed. There had to be a first. If that's the truth, then where's the first? Multiverses are, are ridiculous. It's, again, one, an idea that somebody came up with to say, well, this could be what happened. Well, okay, well, where, as Jim said, where did the first universe come from? There still had to be a single point in time that it began. 
so scientists, here's another Lincoln, I uh, didn't get all of his name up there. Scientists can no longer hide behind the past eternal. There is a no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. So here's the argument again. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. I'm going to ask you what to give me this next week. So I expect you to have this down pat, all right? Because this is not a complicated set of premises. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Essentially, that's what Hubble did. But how did he get one half billion years? Well, there, again, you're going back to that same thing I talked about before, that androgynous thing that, we, that I talked about before, androgynous principle. There's, there's principles there that say God tweaked the universe right after the, the cause of it. And some people say, well, that caused it to appear to have a different time span. Others say that in the beginning, the, the universe was expanding faster so what we measure in terms of time was faster, and so they, they kind of unpack that and try to give that as a reason. I don't know what the reason is. There's, there's at least two right there that could be the reason. But again, I, there's no way we've got the complexity to go into that today. But, the, but it is, there are, there are things there that would cause Hubble to look at it and say, well, this is this many billions of years old. We, we seem to hold to the principle that maybe the, the Earth is only 10 to 12,000 years old. Uh, the universe is only that old. But we don't know. But, but it, it does make sense that if everything had an explosion at the beginning and it's slowing down now, that perhaps there's, there's an illusion there that we can't adjust for, for that. I don't know. David? That subject gets complicated really quickly. It does. But there's two references I can give you that are pretty quick. And there's one in, um, I think it's Psalms where, um, or Proverbs, where it says uh, God expanded the, um, the sky, the heavens. And that's where you have, could have a young earth become an old earth because he spread the heavens out. That's backed up scientifically by um, Einstein in that, and proven, I should say, by the time, sp uh, space, gravity, continuum argument, how time is, is slower the le in a less gravitational uh, field and also with speed. So if the heavens were expanded, it would appear to be a long time here, but in reality, in, for lack of a better word, it would actually be short. That's kind of a simplified if I may, yep. the GPS system, Quickly. the GPS system must be corrected every few seconds, not even seconds. It's constantly being corrected because of the, the time is different in a satellite over the Earth than it is on Earth, and if the clock gets out of sync, the location gets out of sync. I think mine hadn't been adjusted in a long time. <laughs> Okay, so here, here is the, the nature and attributes of what they say the causal agent of the universe must be. The causal agent of the universe must be spaceless. Why? Yeah, there wasn't any space. Prior to the creation, there was no space. He has to be timeless. Same thing. There was no time. He has to be immaterial because there was no material. There was no matter. When we say nothing, we mean literally no thing. Nothing. Not like they are arguing that frozen from movement means nothing. It's just there's ad literally nothing. Had to be uncaused. Why? No. 
this, this thing that created has to be causeless. Not, not the universe. We're, we're talking about the, the thing that created the universe had to be causeless. As we would say, the person that created the universe had to be causeless. Because if he had a beginning, what does that mean? He had to have a cause. And you keep going backward. You see what I'm saying? So you, there had to be one eternal being. Had to be. There, there can't be. If he had a cause, then something caused him, and that would be God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, had to be tremendously powerful to speak the world into existence. Something out of nothing. The, the, the theologians say ex nihilo creation. When you hear somebody say ex nihilo, all that means is out of nothing. Literally nothing. It is. It is. It's, it, but, it, but understand, we don't have to comprehend it. We just have to apprehend it. And the apprehension of this is really important for a person that, that wants to be a witness for Christ in a place where, in a, in a time that we live today, where so many people say, I just don't believe in the existence of God. And if, we, if we're not prepared to talk to people, I mean, come out with Jim and I on the street. Let's, let's talk to some folks. See if you don't run into this pretty quick. And then you're, you're left without anything to equip you. So don't get, don't, it's sort of like getting hung up on the Trinity. I mean, we, Jim and I already had a conversation with a guy about the Trinity. And there's no way to totally comprehend the Trinity because we're in finite bodies that cannot un understand the magnificence and the omnipotence of an eternal being. But we can apprehend and get our arms around at least part of what God tells us about himself. And we can do the same thing here. The, the, the power, though, necessary to create everything out of nothing, that, that's... And then what do we have in all of the world, in all the writings of all the world, in all of the movies of all the world, uh, what do we have that, that can be this other than what the Bible designates as our holy God? There's nothing else realistically presented, anything. N nothing that's, e that's presented anywhere that gives you a reason for these things. And that's why it's important. Come on. So it's reasonable, therefore, to believe that God does exist. And it's whether you're talking to children, as in this example, or whether you're talking to a person in your family that just... And, and here's... None of us should be arrogant about this stuff. Because we can't, we can't comprehend it. We, as I say, we can apprehend it, but we can't comprehend it. But we, none of us should be arrogant about this. We should lay it out there and say, but have you ever thought about? I mean, every, the principle is everything that has a beginning has a cause. Would you agree with that? And then go to the next principle, the, the next premise. Well, the universe, it's been proven now by scientists and all, all scientists that are well thought of today, say, even Hawking says that he can't understand how there could not be a beginning but he's tried to argue against it for a long, long, long time. So this, this conversation is going to happen either with you or without you. Yep. My experience is people are basically lazy, mm -hmm. uh, particularly mentally, and unless you make your um, argument in very simple terms, that leads them down the yellow brick road. They won't, once you try to get into a, a deep conversation like this, they'll throw up their arms and go, no, I just don't believe, and, and they'll stop. Um, so I always try to make it as simple as possible and as one and one as two and, and really make it easy for, for other people yeah, because once they get confused, they get defensive and yeah. the conversation's over. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point. We, we've, we've got, this is, this is not a complex argument. This is a simple argument. But what you will find in real life is what happens talking to people on the street 
or talking to people in the grocery store or talking to your family members is the same thing that's happened today. You get off on tangents. You can't, you can't run the tangents with people because they'll say, well, what about the, the quantum mechanics of this thing? I mean, dark holes and, you know, and you, you go, let's bring it back to the question. You know, can, can we stick with, can you give me an answer? Do you believe that everything that has a beginning has a cause? Let's just try to keep it simple because that's what happens. People will run tangents and that's a, a, a method of diversion. If people don't have answers for what you're talking about, they'll give you a diversion. They'll throw up a smoke screen. They'll throw up flack in the air. Yeah, David. I'll stop in a minute. Right. When I was in sales, we used to define a sales call as the art of bringing a conversation to a successful conclusion. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's really what you're doing here. You're trying to keep the subject as simple as you possibly can in a very, very complex world where there's more, really there's more known today than there ever has been all of history. Even when I was learning this stuff, you know, 15 years ago, it was a very different world talking to people than it is today. People will run tangents with you and throw up stuff. I mean, it, it's remarkable what they'll come up with, but you can see some of the things that, that brilliant people will try to do to escape the existence of God. We talked about that today. Well, it's like, a, it's like a yo-yo. The universe is expanding, and then it gets to a certain point, and then it goes back down again, and it reaches the bottom, and it starts all over again. And then, you know, and there's no evidence for that. Th what evidence is there for that? Well, there's not any, but there could be. But, but our, again, our objective is to keep, keep the argument, as David said, on the subject. You know, let's just keep trying to bring it back to the subject. So somebody give me the cosmological argument. What is the argument for cause and effect? Okay, go on, get your microphone. The cause must be outside of space and time, immaterial, very powerful, uncaused. Yeah. Yeah. Spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and powerful. Mighty, mighty powerful. So the, the point of all of this is what in the end? When you're talking to somebody about these things, what is really the point of all of this? Okay, not, well not prove that there is, but prove that there's evidence. Yeah, and the, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's using commonly accepted logic principles like a syllogism, which is, which is accepted by all logicians. David? Yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around it, but I guess the, the end game is if we can make a good case for the presence of God, we can make a good case for God is love and a good case for God loves you. Yeah. And this is a very long-term process. Don't think you're going to do this in 30 minutes with somebody. So here, here's what I would say the end game is. The end game is to get them to think. Just consider. Consider these things so that the next conversation, it's like when I when we left, Farron and I left that, that group of guys the other day, uh, last Wednesday, we just left them with stuff to think about. And now we're going to go back in a couple of weeks and sit down and begin that conversation. So now we're going to let them mull that stuff over, try to come up with some really good objections for us, and then we'll go back and, and have another conversation, just continue the conversation on. Get, leave them something else to think about and leave. 
You know, we always want to leave something for people to be thinking about. Somebody that is absolutely determined to grab hold of Hawking or Richard Dawkins or some of these theorist points of view are going to be taken back by this rather simple argument. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. Would you agree with that? The universe had a beginning. All reasoned scientists today believe that. All well thought of scientists, and no scientist that holds any other principle today is very well thought of in the scientific community. They may be thought of very highly in the atheist theorist community, but not in the scientific community. But, but then leave them with something to say, then the universe had to have a cause. And one of the, one of the things that, that often is talked about now is this, um, that the causal agent being the, the creative design that is there, there had to be a creator. So that goes back to what we were talking about early on, that, that this, there's a design in the universe, there's a balance in the universe. Scientists today can't even figure out how it's staying together, that it, it ought to, to have exploded out of existence. And that comes in that tweak in the beginning that, was, that I made reference to a couple of times. The scientists, well, you know, it should be doing this and it's doing this. Why is, why is it not doing this? Well, there was something that happened right after the Big Bang. What happened? Well, there was, there was a tweak in all of that. And that tweak is, is one of the atheists said, is the fingerprint of God. Yeah. Does that mean what we call the fall? No, no. This has to do with the alignment of planets, the, the gravitational pull, everything with regard to the scientific part of things. How did it stay together after the explosion? How is it remaining together now? Uh, and that goes back for us to Hebrews where it says that Christ is the one that holds all things together. So. Anybody else? We're out of time here. <laughs> Quickly, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you and praise you that you have